Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Today, we're going to wander around these woodlands, see what we can find and what there is to discover. So let's go. What do you know about them plants? Those purple flowers on the bank of the stream are known as Impatience glandulifera, otherwise known as Himalayan balsam, touch-me-nots, or bobby tops. And it's known for being explosive. Found growing along the water's edge, averaging heights of 6 to 10 feet. It features bright red, crimson stalks, serrated leaves, and foxglove-like bell-shaped flowers, colloquially known as bobby tops, as they somewhat resemble the shape of a police officer's helmet. The bees love the Himalayan balsam. They climb right up into those colourful, bell-shaped caves and get smothered in all of that lovely pollen. Oh, yes. It's what we like. But the most interesting and notorious feature of this plant are its seed pods, as they explode as a method of dispersing their seeds, making slightly audible popping sounds, a clicking type of noise, and that's enough to arouse one's curiosity and perhaps make some inquiries. It'd drive you nuts if you didn't know what it was. It is the plants, and that explosive method of seed dispersal allows the seeds to spread far and wide, proliferating itself along the riverbanks and shooting itself into the water so that they may head downstream and colonise more riverbanks. The seed pods will explode on their own when they are ripe and ready, but if you were to rub or gently squeeze the seed pods in between your fingers, they may prematurely explode. And that's where they get the name touch-me-nots, and hence the Latin genus of impatience referring to its sensitivity and explosive volatility. Fun fact, the fancy technical term for explosive methods of seed dispersal is autocory. That's the key word. That's the secret. But beautiful and lovely though it may be, Himalayan balsam is a non-native invasive species, which some regional councils will actually encourage you to rip out if you see it growing in the spring and early summer to prevent its prolific proliferation and preserve the native flora. Attempting to dispose of them in the late summer and autumn, when the seed pods are ripe and ready to burst, will do nothing other than spread the seeds everywhere. Kind of a mutually assured destruction type of arrangement. There is legislation, known as the Wildlife and Countryside Act of 1981, which makes it an offence to plant, aid or abet Himalayan balsam to grow and spread in the wild. In other words, you can't be going around fondling your bobby tops, mate. The High Inquisitor has forbidden it. They are, however, edible. The young, smaller leaves and flowers are edible as a salad green, and those notorious seed pods and seeds are also edible, tasting like nuts. Most pleasant and nutritious when cooked to break down the calcium oxalate crystals. That's the strap. Gathering them is the tricky part. You'd have to stick a bag over the head of the plant to catch the seeds before they disperse. They are most slippery, most elusive. Yes. Squirrel POV. That's what we like. Behold, this impressive and expansive mushroom known as Meripolis giganteus or more commonly known as the giant polypore or blackening polypore. Let us observe its features. Often found growing out of tree stumps, usually those of beech and oak. Shades of brown and beige, almost a felt, suede-like appearance. Smooth, fan-shaped and flat, paler towards the margin. Younger specimens will have a flattened, more uniform appearance, though as they age, they will thin out, start crinkling up, becoming more wavy and undulating. The underside, creamy pale yellow pores that bruise brown or black when damaged. A key feature that helps to distinguish it from lookalikes. Some field guides will say that it's inedible, not due to toxicity but more impalatability. Quite acidic, rubbery and tough. Not anyone's first choice. Some field guides will say that it is technically edible. I suppose it depends how hungry you are. Cooked, younger specimens, such as these, would be preferred. They have the texture and consistency of cooked chicken, as you can see. Meaty, substantial. Does not have the taste of chicken, though. Tastes just like a store-bought button mushroom. 
Older and larger specimens will be more sour and acidic though, somewhat inedible by that point. Mushroom connoisseurs may begin to salivate when coming across this mushroom, mistakenly thinking that it was its more gourmet, highly prized, delicious lookalike known as Hen of the Woods, Griffola frondosa. That would most certainly be a post-apocalyptic treasure trove of calories, as it also has the texture and consistency of cooked chicken, meaty, better tasting, not leaning towards the sourness and acidity of the giant polypore. It is considered one of the finer edible mushrooms out here, on par with the chanterelles and the oyster mushrooms. It's worth noting. Compared to the giant polypore, Hen of the Woods tends to be more irregular in its overall presentation, a non-uniform, chaotic appearance. Underneath, the pores of Hen of the Woods are white to off-white, and do not stain brown or black when they are damaged. So that's how you know. But here's another fun fact. Hen of the Woods has a namesake sibling mushroom known as Chicken of the Woods, aka the Sulphur Shelf, Latiporus sulfurius, which too is edible, but not as nice as Hen of the Woods. Said to be more rubbery and tough, like overcooked chicken. It is also known as Crab of the Woods, reporting to taste a little like crab, which is interesting. However, despite its appetizing name, it doesn't agree with everyone. Some get nauseous, some don't. It's 50-50, you either do or you don't. I personally have not had the pleasure, so we can only speculate. But its appearance is most lovely. Pastel orange and yellow colours. Candy corn colours. It's most aesthetic. Oi, oi, oi. Looks like someone's been landing a brat. Upped and left in a hurry, they did, yes, sir. Left everything behind. Tent, sleeping bag, backpack there too, though I won't rummage. Hmm. One does genuinely wonder what makes people just up and leave like this. This is the mystery. A quick little inconspicuous finger ma jingle. You've probably seen this amongst the grasslands once or twice. This is the shepherd's purse, Capsella bursa pastoris. Thin, wiry stalks, ladder like rungs of heart or arrowhead shaped seed pods with a tiny white raceme flower head. Oh, that's most delicate, most gracious, most commonly regarded as a weed. Shepherd's purse is named after its most salient feature, those arrowhead shaped flat seed pods, which eventually dry out and open up to reveal orange copper coloured little seeds, much like coins in a purse, hence the name. Although if I were in charge of taxonomy, the naming of things, I'd think those look a lot more like spider eggs than coins. So I would call this plant the spider plant and we'd all be having a good time. The whole plant is edible. It has a slight peppery taste, a bit like arugula, which is quite pleasant indeed. The leaves, the flower heads, the seeds, the stalk, the seed pods, all edible. Throw it in the stew pot.
Atop the still ponds, you'll often find a carpet of floating green algae, otherwise known as duckweed or water lentils. Let us inspect it. They are like a collective conglomerate mass of hundreds of little tiny individual lily pads in appearance. Botanically, they are not related to lilies, but within any mass of duckweed, there may be two or three different species, varying in size, shape, whether they have a root or not, whether they grow in clusters, whether it's an individual or a frond of three. Sporodola, Lemnolandaltia, Wolfia, three very common species of duckweed. Ah, oh, nothing's ever simple out here, is it? I would say that this is Lem the Minor. Could be wrong. Can't say that my duckweed game is impeccable. Wolfia, I know, is extremely small, like granules of sugar small. Anyway, fun fact. Duckweed could be considered a potential future candidate for a superfood, similar to spirulina or kale. Gather, boil, dry, grind into a powder, most nutritious quite high in protein for a plant. Oh yes, something to thicken up the soup during the famine. Now that is good news, like the sawdust. And it is used that way in some Thai dishes. That's resourcefulness. Tell you what though, here's another fun fact. Where ye find duckweed, you'll also find ducks and dragonflies of course, but you will also find mosquitoes, as they tend to frequent still bodies of water. Why? Well, Mosquitoes actually begin their life as aquatic, water-dwelling nymph-like creatures. Mosquitoes lay their eggs in the water. They hatch in the water. They begin the first part of their life as tadpoles, essentially, until they emerge, retract their wings, and then hunt you down. Oh, yes. That's really good to know. If you've got a pond in your backyard and you see these little things swimming around, thinking they're cute little tadpoles, Oh, they ain't. And you're about to learn that the hard way. As is tradition. One must always throw a twig into a duckweed-covered pond in order to receive the blessings. These jingle jangles are the poisonous fruits of the bittersweet nightshade plant, Solanum dolcomara. Look at them! the fruits of those purple and yellow dart-like flowers, looking most succulent, most juicy. Let's find a nice shady spot to make a fire. First, we need a log, and a lovely second log, and we put them together in the shape of a V. Nice logs, very good boy. And we will build a normal little fire in between those logs. Nice kindling, all cozy and snug. Get a little teepee going, Going a bit abstract on this one. The little sticks burn the mid sticks, which burn the big sticks. This is the way. Let's get this fire lit. Right then, this particular fire is called the hunter's fire. Two logs in the shape of a V. Build your fire between them where the logs meet. Easy peasy. This protects the fire itself from getting blown apart by the wind, but also to protect you so that strong winds don't blow hot coals across the floor and into your incredibly meltable, potentially flammable, plastic tent. So that's good to know. Also, you can cook over it. Place your pot or pan right here. Very simple. The wider the pot or pan, the better and more stable indeed, but this cup is wide enough for the demonstration purposes. It will do. Let us begin the rehydration process. Oh my goodness. Oh, could have been a disaster. One must never underestimate the importance of a stable tripod. Very important. Easy does it now. You love the sounds. Okay, try not to extinguish the fire while we're at it. That's the strap. Right, let that do its thing. It's never a great thing if your fire is pumping out smoke like that. That's incomplete combustion. The fire needs more heat, more oxygen. You need to add more kindling and blow on it. However, the aesthetics is nice. The scents. Oh, the ambiance. It should look like this. All flame, no smoke. More flame than smoke, 
That is most effective. Oh, yes. We have our boil. Nice. We're chilling, hydrating. We're having a lovely time, that's what we're doing. Sitting around the campfire, sharing ghost stories. Pretending that we don't notice the Wendigo that's been stalking us all day. It's important to remain calm in such situations.
amongst the grass you may find these ankle height spikelets of violet flowers. This is bugle weed, Ajuga reptans. At first glance you could mistake it for a false nettle, very similar in multiple respects. It also looks a bit like catnip, same style, same family of plants, the laminaceae. That's interesting. The flowers are these flat, oddly shaped, purple, gingerbread man shaped flowers, right? You see that? Snow angel shaped flowers, notched arrowhead shaped flowers. No. Hooded, cloaked monk shaped flowers, yes. It is, however, not edible, to humans at least. It is toxic. The butterflies like it though. That bird there is called a jay. That is factually correct information. Most majestic. Oh, look at them leaves! And here we have a big old patch of longwort. Pulmonaria officinalis. Hmm. Bugleweed, longwort. Feeling Harry Potter vibes today. Longwort features clusters of trumpet shaped flowers, various shades of purple and pink, all on the same flower head, with its most salient feature being those white, speckled, freckled leaves. That's interesting. Is it diseased? No, sir. It's just the way it is. Is it edible? Yes indeed! The leaves and the flowers are good to go, but the leaves are a little bitter. It wouldn't be anyone's first choice, but throw it in a salad, use it as a filler for the famine, that's a high value plant. This plant has an interesting history in its use in the principle of correspondence, an old school medieval branch of speculative medicine, which suggested that if a plant resembles a piece of bodily anatomy, then it was speculated that the plant could treat diseases relating to that body part. Red vegetables being good for treating disorders of the blood and the circulatory system. Yellow fruits are being good for treating jaundice, stuff like that. Not necessarily always completely wrong or ineffective, but not always right on the money either. It's speculative medicine. The leaves of lungwort resemble diseased spotted lungs. Therefore, it was speculated to be able to treat diseases of the lung. Whether it does or doesn't, I don't know. And as this plant is safe to eat, there wouldn't have been any harm in trying. Some ripe, delicious hawthorn berries. Mine's the pip in the center. We know the berries are edible. We know the leaves are edible, smelling like apple skins. But in the spring, the flower buds are also edible and have a nutty taste, like an almond with floral notes. Chewy and abundant. Not the worst thing in the world to eat during a famine. Wholesome, nutritious vegetation that pairs well with a bottle of M&Ms and a bag of Lucozade for powerful combinations. Oh, it's chaos out here. Blackberries. The hedgerow is abundant with blackberries. Ah oh, yes, we will engorge and recharge the manor upon these. Elderberries, looking most ripe. Most delicious, overloading today, feeling powerful. The humble crab apple, the bitter slow, the proud fireweed. A big old bush of napweed, that's edibles for days. A solid member of any meadow, ragwort, Jacobea vulgaris. A little artist's conch, Ganoderma aplanatum. Admire it, look at it, leave it a love note. What is this, a dandelion? No sir. This is a bristly ox tongue, Helminthophica echioides. 
What a mouthful. Not something you'd want to put in your mouth though. Look at those spikes. This plant is what you would get if you could cross a dandelion and a thistle. Bristled red stems, small raised pimples on the spiky leaf. This is definitely a plant that wants you to stay away, yes sir. The only part of this plant not smothered in spikes is the flower itself. Welcoming of pollinating insect only. They will turn to seed, resembling a dandelion in that respect too. The individual seeds look like angelic baby carrots. It's quite interesting indeed. Oh my goodness, what is this? This dandelion lookalike is the cat's ear, otherwise known as flatweed, Hypochirus radicata, aka the false dandelion. But it's easy to tell apart. Flatweed has a lightly hairy leaf with rounded lobes, as opposed to dandelion's smooth leaves with sharp lobes. Cat's ears have thin, solid stems that can fork and host multiple flower heads per stem, as opposed to dandelion, which is a single flower head on a single, hollow, thicker, unforked stem. All parts of the plant are edible though, though the wiry stems are not particularly palatable. The leaves can be blanched over the flames of a fire to remove the hairs. Easy peasy, eat the nature. Mm. Get out the GoPro, find the B-roll, shoot the B-roll, love the B-roll. Oh yes, fragrant scents. Good for sniffing, olfactory stimulations. Teasel! It was upon Teasel that we found the sacred gold finch, highly prized seed amongst the bird folk. Yes, yes, loving this oak tree in particular. Most gorgeous. That's what we like. Oh, a cheeky little Macrolepiota procera. Looking most gorgeous, most asphyxic.
damn. Yeah, damn. Lovely blue skies today. Let us take a moment to observe the wasp spider. Most menacing, most frightening, the wasp spider is a strange thing. Perhaps the strangest thing you've seen all week. But let me one up that for you. With the stemonitis, look at it. I want you to look at it, think thoughts about it. A slime mold that grows on rotting trees. It's like if you ripped out a hair follicle, planted it upside down and it began to grow and take on a life of its own. It's sentient now. That's horrific. Like a tripod from War of the Worlds, it just looks alien. But it is aesthetic. That's what we like. Here we have the Clitosobes, aka the Fool's Funnel. Clitosobe rivulosa. Very toxic indeed. High levels of the mycotoxin muscarin, which is also found in the pink mycenas and the fly agarix. But Clitosobes have significantly higher levels of it. Very dangerous. Feature-wise, it has an off-white cream-coloured cap, gills and stem. As the mushroom ages, it begins to take on the shape of a funnel or a megaphone. They can also be found growing in large fairy rings. Any mushroom that has a white cap, white gills and white stipe should be avoided anyway because of its resemblance to the destroying angel, Amanita virosa, one of the deadliest mushrooms in the world. Not one for the stew pot. Cheeky bit of hedge bindweed. Wild arum. The fruit of the Aramaculatum plant. You will observe it. Very poisonous. The notorious giant hogweed. In its late adolescent stage, indeed. You'd perhaps mistake it for cow parsley. That'd be painful mistakes. Look at those purple blotched stalks. Look at those needle-like trichomes. Look at that impressive puffy white umbrella of flowers. Let us steer clear. It's peak, high traffic hours for the acorns right now. An ant and a ladybird together on an acorn. Competing, coexisting, cooperating, who knows? The wasp would also like to mingle. That's extroverted, highly social maneuvers. Fun fact about acorns, you can make flour with them. Make bread. It doesn't contain gluten, so it always comes out quite brittle and crumbly, but Hey ho. When collecting acorns, drop them in water. The ones that float, throw them away. That's an indication that they've been eaten inside by weevils. Compromised integrity. There may even be the weevil larvae still inside. Extra protein if you want to think about it that way. You'll probably notice they have a hole bored in them anyway, but the float method is faster than individually inspecting each acorn. Traditional recipes usually have half acorn flour, half wheat flour. That was an old tactic for getting more out of your wheat flour in times of scarcity and famine, when wheat flour was like gold dust. Oh, that's more thick enough for the soup. We're gonna be eating good. But another fun fact, sometimes on acorns, you'll find these oddly shaped, ragged green lumps growing off of it. These are called nopper galls. For you see, when gall wasps, which are tiny, minuscule, millimetre-sized insects, inject their eggs into the acorns, like weevils do, a tumorous growth forms around the injection site. That tumorous growth is the nopper gall. A hatched gall wasp will then eat away at the inside of the gall, grow in strength, leave the gall, and then fly off to go about gall wasp business. It's like a cocoon, in a sense, that the gall wasp mutates the oak tree into producing for its larvae. That's most peculiar. Some glistening ink caps. Coprinellus micaceus. Oi, oi, oi. There's a cheeky little death cap over here. Solitary, nestled snugly within the base of the tree. Oh, that ochre, sickly, phlegm-coloured cap. It's unmistakable. Let's leave it alone. Ah, <sighs> time to chill. Relax for a bit with the scenic shots under the tree to contemplate the mysteries. Mm, yes, ask ourselves questions such as how and why? Why do I keep getting migraines and waking up in strange places? Who knows? Beat me. It is a mystery.
And on that bombshell, it's time to end. Ah, it was a beautiful day, and we learned a lot. That's good. So now, let's praise our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Let's hit them weights and drink them protein shakes. Push!